once again to the Eisenhower National Historic Site. We're so pleased that you could join us today for our fourth and final lecture of the day. Our final speaker today will be April Cheek Messier, who is going to be speaking to us on service and sacrifice, the story of the Bedford Boys, and the making of the National D-Day Memorial. April Messier is the president of the National D-Day Memorial in Bedford, Virginia. She is a native of Bedford, Virginia, and has been with the National D-Day Memorial Foundation since 2001. She served as the director of education from 2001 to 2010 before becoming vice president of education. In 2013, she was named president and CEO of the foundation. She served on several boards, including the chair of the Virginia World War II Heritage Alliance, and was appointed by the governor of Virginia to serve on the Virginia, War, <clears throat> excuse me, Virginia World War II Heritage Memorial Board of Directors in Richmond. From 2009 to 2015, she was a member of the board of directors for the Virginia Association of Museums as well. Ms. Cheek Messier also lectures on the history of World War II and has written for several publications. In 2019, John Long and April Cheek Messier published we, we Will Remember Them, an accounting of the D-Day Fallen, the most authoritative list of allied fatalities ever compiled, which embodied more than 20 years of research from the Memorial's Foundation. The results of this work is the only name-by-name -name listing of D-Day fatalities in the world. Cheek Messier received her BA degree in English and History from Hollins University. She acquired two master's degrees, one in history from Virginia Tech and another in education from Hollins University. She resides in Bedford, Virginia with her husband, John, and their five children. So please, let's welcome Ms. Ms. Messier. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's wonderful to be here. It's such a lovely afternoon. Um, how many of you have actually been to the National D-Day Memorial? Raise your hand. Okay, a good number. Well, wonderful. And if you haven't been in a while, I encourage you to please come back. We have lots going on. I'll talk a little bit about that in uh, just a bit. But um, I do want to um, today talk a little bit about um, when Dan called me um, and asked me to come out and, and speak here, I, he really wanted to talk a little bit about the story of the Bedford Boys. And I know a lot of people People know the story. If you've read Alex Kershaw's book, The Bedford Boys, you've um, you certainly have heard that heartrending story of what happened in our community. And so, I wanted to tell you a little bit more um, about that today and share that with you. And then, how all of this really evolved into creating our na our nation's monument to D-Day in that small uh, community. Um, I did grow up in Bedford, and so as a child growing up, I heard many of these stories. Um, I, uh, but what's what's interesting is that I heard about them because I, I, I knew so many of the families personally. Um, and ironically, in the community, you didn't talk about it. Um, you really didn't say a whole lot about it uh, because it was still so incredibly raw and painful and difficult um, to discuss. And so you just didn't. You kind of, everybody went about their business. There were even veterans in town who came back from D-Day um, that many people didn't even know had been there as, as, as people got older and everything. You really didn't know. Um, as one of the D-Day veterans who survived and came back told me, he said it was like after the war, a black veil had been draped over the whole community. And it was like that for decades. And I think really when we talk about the story of the Bedford Boys, we really wanna talk about the impact on communities across our country, the impact of uh, the war on people who uh, gave their all. Um, and then, you know, D-Day was more than just a day, for example. These families lived with it for the rest of their lives. Um, because they lost their loved ones on those beaches all those years ago. Um, a community heals, but there's always a gap, and certainly we felt that uh, in the community of Bedford. Um, so a little bit of uh, history about the memorial, and I, I'll talk more uh, at the end about it, but the memorial was dedicated in 2001. It's in Bedford for a very solemn reason. If you've been there, you uh, know, and some of these pictures may be hard to see, It's a, it, but it is our nation's monument to D-Day. It's to all the Allied forces who served on D-Day, it's not just to the Bedford Boys. It's not just to the American uh, forces on D-Day. It's to all of the Allied forces who served. But it is in Bedford for a very solemn reason, and that is because Bedford lost 20 young men 
on June 6, 1944. Just on June the 6th, 1944, 20 young men from the community of Bedford would give their lives. And this was a tiny community in 1944. It's a very rural community. Uh, the town itself had around 3,000 people. The surrounding county was a little larger. Um, but you can imagine this is, you know, everybody went to school together. Uh, many of you went to church together. You played ball together. You grew up knowing it. Most people were related. I mean, you know, everybody <laughs> knew everybody. Um, and so it was, uh, you can imagine the tragedy of having uh, 20 just on D-Day. Uh, by the way, nine more would give their lives uh, from Bedford during the Normandy campaign. Um, the impact that that has on a tiny community. It was absolutely devastating. And by the way, oftentimes you'll hear numbers like 19 from uh, who died on uh, D-Day from Bedford. There were actually 19 from Company A. There was one from Company F who was killed on D-Day as well. So for a total of 20 just on June the 6th. And to tell a little bit of, of those stories, because I really think Bedford is emblematic again of all these communities across the country, all these home front communities who supported these citizen soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, those who participated in the invasion and so many of them never returned. They all have their own stories, you know, and I think that's what's important to remember is they're not statistics. These are not numbers. These are people who had hoped to come back from the war and live their lives. Uh, this right here is one of my favorite pictures uh, from the war. Um, this is John Wilkes, John and Betty Wilkes. And I think in this picture, you can really, I think it captures the period perfectly. You've got these two individuals who are badly in love. They're newly married. Um, they, uh, this was taken in 1941. John had joined the National Guard, uh, John Wilkes, at, at 17, um, mainly because his brother had joined, so he thought he would join too, lied about his age, joins up, uh, and like so many of them, joined to earn a little extra money. This was, you know, Depression era, times were tough, and um, during that time, many of these young men uh, joined the National Guard to earn a little extra money. But I think you can see just the pride that John has there in that photograph for Betty, the pride that Betty has for her new husband as she's donning his hat there. Um, it's a time of, I think, innocence um, before knowing what is the uncertainty of what's to come. And you can see, I think, the, this desperate attempt to kind of hold on to those moments. Um, this is another picture of uh, John and uh, Betty Wilkes. And by the way, Betty would go wherever John uh, was. If he was, uh, when, once he was deployed, uh, John was actually sent down to Camp Landing, Florida. And he was down there for a month and she actually left her job. She told everybody at work, I'm leaving for a month and I'll be back sometime. I don't know. I, you know, and she went down there and she spent the whole month um, with uh, her husband uh, before he was deployed. They spent a lot of time together. She wrote to him faithfully. Um, and it was very important um, for these uh, young men and women to uh, continue to stay in touch as much as they could. As I have to explain that to young people because they think it's such instantaneous, um, you know, today where you can get on a Zoom or wherever to stay in touch with your loved ones. It would take a long time. And so Betty would send these uh, messages and care packages um, just about every week. Um, and one afternoon, and this was in, um, this was in June, late uh, June, Betty is walking across the street to mail her package. Um, at, it wasn't called the Green's Drugstore quite yet. It would be later um, in 1945, but this was, the, this was where you hung out. It was the hangout. This is where you got your five cent cup of coffee. It's where you read your paper, you, all the town gossip. You went to the drugstore to hear the gossip and you hung out with everybody. Um, but this is also where you mailed your packages. It's where the telegrams came in. This was in very kind of a hub in the community. And Betty was mailing her package to John and she was getting ready to go into Green's Drugstore there when um, another, a lady across the street calls to her and says, Betty, Betty, and she runs across the street and she said, did you hear? I, I received a letter that said John was killed on D-Day. And you can imagine the shock. Um, no one had received news yet um, of what had happened to Company A. And um, of course, Betty was very distraught over the news. She instantly went home to her apartment, which was right in town here. Um, and she, she was um, essentially bedridden for a week. Um, she could not believe that it was true. And finally, her family convinced her that, well, we don't have official news, so it's probably not true. And so she actually ends up um, going back to work. The very, the very day she went back to work, uh, she worked at the silk mill in town. Um, she's working away. Her husband, her si uh, sister works with her there at the silk mill. And her sister noticed somebody come through the door with a telegram. 
and uh, she quickly grabbed that person um, and told her to hold on. They took Betty um, home in their car, and Betty knew, without anybody saying anything, that her beloved John uh, was gone. Um, that was the first of many, many, many telegrams, letters, news about what had happened to Company A that would start uh, coming uh, to these families in the community. Um, again, a very rural community uh, where everybody knows everyone. And so you can imagine the tragedy as this news would, um, would happen. And Betty is the, the first one to say that John was very uh, proud of serving and so were all of them. Again, 1930s, you're, uh, many of them joined up early or, or later in the 30s and they're earning that extra money. Uh, one of the veterans who came back, Roy Stevens, who I adored, um, he uh, used to tell me that he joined for the extra money. You get a dollar for every drill that you completed. So that was, a, that was big money then. Um, but also he said he joined, and this is uh, Roy Stevens here in that photograph with his future wife uh, there. And uh, Roy said, I joined for the uniform because I knew it would attract the ladies. And so he was very proud of that. Um, and, and so they all joined for different reasons. And again, many of them joined because that's, that's um, you know, that's just kind of what you did. And a lot of their friends and cousins and others uh, were there as well. They all trained um, in the courthouse there at the uh, basement of the courthouse armory. Uh, um, is where they would have their drills and that's where they would meet. And it was so icon iconic um, of Company A to be uh, trained there. They actually got their photograph taken um, you know, before they left, they had a, a picture made on the, um, the steps of the courthouse there. And that was so iconic that when Company A was called up for service again, many, many decades later in 2004, um, all the men in, comp in the company actually went in town and got their pictures taken uh, right there on the courthouse steps. There were a lot of people who could not attend that um, because they remembered what had happened decades prior and that many of those men never came home. I'm happy to say that uh, in 2004, after those young, um, men and women were deployed, they, they all came home. Uh, so it was a different outcome. But, um, and that you see the courthouse there today and um, where they would have taken that picture. If you look in the very, and it's hard to see, I know, but in the very back of that photograph, you can actually see Company A. Um, again, many of them joined up. Uh, they are you know, doing their training and everything. February 3rd, 1941, they're called up for active duty. Um, and at that point, you know, this is getting a little real. Um, and, it, and I'm sorry, I said, um, yes, February 3rd, 1941. And so at that point, they are um, going to have some pretty intense training. Uh, they are, uh, they have a huge parade and a dance and, a, and um, basically a big party for them uh, on the eve of their uh, leaving uh, to go out of town. And you can see uh, them marching down Main Street there. Everybody's so proud of them. And they go to Fort Meade, Maryland. And this is probably uh, of the time that the Bedford Boys spent together. Uh, Fort Meade, Maryland was probably the best. Um, experience that they had because they were still close to home. Uh, they could still jump in the car, uh, get home on the weekends. It was five days of drill. It was tough, um, but they really enjoyed coming home and seeing their families, their loved ones, their sweethearts. Uh, this is a picture of Company uh, A here. Um, but they did have some training would get progressively um, uh, more difficult uh, the longer they were in. Eventually, uh, they're going to end up at Camp AP Hill. Um, they go to Camp AP Hill, which uh, Bob Slaughter, who I'll talk about in a little bit, he's the founder of the memorial. Uh, Bob Slaughter called it Camp AP Hill. Um, and he said, you know, the U.S. military has a knack for finding godforsaken wastelands for army campsites, noting it was full of briar thickets, wood ticks, and chiggers. He said the drinking water was chlorine laced and warm, and the showers were ice cold. What's with the hats? <laughs> um, they, you know, wasn't the best of times. Um, but, you know, by um, December 7th, 1940, one, we all knows we all know what happens, and by that point, um, they are called up for uh, a year enlistment. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, they're in for the duration at that point. Um, and Roy Stevens, I remember him talking about how uh, as soon as December 7th happened, they all sat around in the uh, in a bar and drank a few beers, and um, they whooped the Japanese that night. He said, but um, you know, they they knew that things were getting uh, pretty pretty real at that point. This is Ray Nance. Ray Nance would be the last surviving officer of Company A. And Ray actually returned to Bedford many years later. It was incredibly difficult for Ray to talk about D-Day. In fact, he rarely talked about D-Day. Um, 
Ray spent some time as we were building the memorial, he would come by, but he would rarely say anything. It would take a lot to get Ray to open up and talk about what had happened because he was one of the few survivors. He really felt very responsible for these men and it was devastating to him that he came home and they didn't. Um, and so I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but uh, Ray certainly remembers um, kind of some omens along the way that he, he thought back on. And one of those was, um, as they, uh, after they uh, were in um, Camp AP Hill, they end up going down to uh, Camp Landing, Florida. They're, they spend a little bit of time there before heading up to uh, New Jersey and then going on to um, uh, New York to catch the Queen Mary so that they can go overseas. Um, and when Ray remembers getting on board the Queen Mary, he looked over and there's this huge ship that's turned over on its side. And it's actually um, ironic that the name of the ship was the USS Normandy. Um, it was the second largest ship um, in the world at the time. It was huge. And he, it had caught fire. It was actually turned over, as you can see from the picture here. And he, he just thought that was so, uh, at the time, he didn't think anything of it because um, he didn't know anything about Normandy, the, what, where they were going to end up. Um, but he said, looking back years later, he thought, what an omen, you know, what would happen to our beloved Company A? And then this is kind of what happened as they were boarding that ship to go um, over to England. Um, the second omen uh, happened when they were crossing over. And this, um, as Roy Stevens used to tell me, he said this was when that their first taste of, of death, really, and, and kind of the reality of war as they're going over and um, an English light cruiser, the, um, the Curacao, uh, actually is cut, um, cut in two um, and sinks. And it's, um, it, Bob Slaughter talks about this as well. He said it was just devastating to watch these English sailors um, essentially die in the water. There was nothing they could do. They felt helpless. Um, you couldn't go back in them. The Queen Mary would have to kind of zigzag in the water. They were afraid of German U-boats. Um, you've got 15,000 troops at any one time on uh, the Queen Mary as, as transporting troops over. Uh, so there was really nothing they can do. And about 300 English sailors would give their lives or, or die in this accident. Um, and Roy Stevens said that was so disturbing to us to see that. And it was something that certainly uh, stuck with them. They're eventually going to end up, um, they go to Tidworth uh, Barracks, which if you've ever uh, been to England and been near Stonehenge, it's very close to Stonehenge. Um, and they were there for a brief time and then they go to Ivy Bridge, England. Now Ivy Bridge was much like Bedford. It's this wonderful quaint community. I've been there a number of times. It's lovely and it reminds you of Bedford, honestly. It's just, the, the, uh, it's, a it's a little village of 1,500 people and um, they took to the Bedford boys immediately. They loved them, they embraced them. They had dinners in their homes, everybody, in a very short time became much like family there. You can go to Ivy Bridge today and they will talk about um, how wonderful it was to um, have the experience of, of having the Bedford boys there and, and not just the Bedford boys, the 116th and uh, these young men who were there. Um, and so they, got a, they had a lot of friendships that they developed in their time there. They're gonna be there for almost 20 months. Um, so you can imagine, you get to know people pretty well in the community. They spend a lot of time um, knowing these families. They live in these little Nissan huts that you see in the picture here. So they lived in these uh, little Nissan huts there. They would um, oftentimes, uh, for free time, they would, um, I, this is right here, Pride, Wingfield, and John Skate. And they would actually get on their bicycles and ride through the countryside uh, to find real eggs because they hated the powdered eggs. And so they, so they spent a lot of time uh, convincing the families uh, to give them some eggs. Um, they, they had a lot of pastimes uh, while they were there. And one of those, of course, um, was drinking. Um, this is the uh, picture of, this is a sportsman, which is where many of them would go and um, have a few drinks. And it's, it, the community was so gracious to them. Vera Luckham, who actually ran this pub, and it's still there, it looks just like that. Um, she actually bought a refrigerator so that they could have cold beer because she knew they didn't like warm beer. So she went out of her way, made sure she secured uh, a refrigerator so that they could have uh, cold beer. But that's how the community cared and loved for them. Uh, many of them in their pastime played baseball. I saw the <coughs> reenactors earlier uh, playing some ball out there and it was, it was really heartwarming to see because it reminds me uh, of some of the Bedford boys here. Um, they were very good. There were five young men um, in the Bedford boys um, who actually played for the 116th Yankees. And the, you know, this was a way to kind of boost morale, um, give them some pastime some in their downtime. And uh, so five of these young men played. And I love this picture because if you look in the center, that's Colonel Canham. 
and Colonel Canham never smiled. Um, you know, he was in charge of the 116th, um, but you can see in that picture there, he's not very happy. He, uh, Bob Slaughter once said, um, you know, he was more afraid of Colonel Canham than he was <laughs> the Germans. Um, but th it really was uh, very uplifting for these young men to um, play some ball. They actually made it to the ETO um, World Series, uh, the World Championships. They, they were kind of this unknown entity, this group of young men who comes into the World Series there. Um, and there's four of the Bedford boys who played on the team, um, you can see. And uh, they uh, end up winning the championship. I mean, it was just this unlikely thing. But they, um, they were very proud of that. Elmer Wright, uh, two of the young men in this photograph will not survive D-Day. That's Elmer Wright and Frank Draper. And Elmer Wright was actually signing with a professional baseball team. He was extraordinarily talented. He would have gone on to play in the majors. Um, but they were very talented, and um, it just goes to show the, the diversity of the young men that were, were in the group there. So by the time the ETO championships is over and they're, they're celebrating that, they're starting to get serious about training. Uh, this is a photo here of Slapton Sands, um, and Slapton Sands is a whole other story, so I'm just going to just, just um, let you know that some of the Bedford boys actually went to Slapton Sands um, on more than one occasion for training. Um, and of course, we know what happens uh, at Sapton Sands when um, some of the uh, German e boats actually end up um, quite by accident discovering uh, this, and uh, quite a few young men would die over 700 at Sapton Sands during training. Now, the Bedford boys were not harmed during that, um, but certainly, again, something that would, um, would be quite haunting. Uh, this is Captain Taylor Fellers and Ray Nance here. And they were very close. Um, of the Bedford boys, um, Taylor Fellers, who's commander of Company A, um, he feels like he can open up and tell Ray just about anything. Um, and as sept uh, by September, he knows by this point that they're going to be basically um, spearheading an invasion. Um, and, he t and he lets Ray know that, that you know, he, and they're preparing for this. Training is getting much more intense at that point. Um, and it is sometime um, around March. The more and more he's hearing um, kind of what's going to happen and everything uh, that's unfolding with the planning, uh, he told Ray, he confided in Ray, and he said, Ray will all be killed. Uh, he was convinced that it was going to be um, very bad uh, for the company. But he never let that on to his men. He never would have said that. He always remained very positive um, with the men around him. Um, Taylor Fellers was um, very dedicated to making sure he was going to get his men back home. In fact, um, Taylor Fellers was actually sick uh, leading up to the invasion. He had developed a very severe sinus infection. He was in the hospital. And June 3rd rolls around, and he basically gets out of bed, and the, the doctors say, you cannot leave, you're too sick. And he said, I'm going to be with my men. And he gets dressed, he discharges himself, he leaves. And it brought the spirits up of the men immensely. Roy Stevens remembers saying, we got our leader back. It made all the difference. They were so excited uh, to have Taylor Fellers back. Of course, it would uh, ultimately cost him his life because he would give his life on June 6, uh, 1944. Now, going back to March uh, earlier um, of 1944, Ivy Lynn Skank, this is Ivy Lynn here. She was a dear, dear woman. And you could talk to Ivy Lynn and she would, whenever you would mention John's name, uh, all those decades later, she would still beam and smile from ear to ear remembering him. It's like she was instantly transported back to those moments with him. And she remembers March of 1944, she awoke from a dream screaming literally screaming, because in the dream, God had told her that John was not coming back. And uh, that was very hard for her. They wrote to each other every single day. They had special moments set aside at five o'clock in the afternoon. She would uh, pray for him and think about him. And at 10 o'clock in England, he would do the same. So they had this little system worked out. Um, John also had the opportunity to miss the invasion he had actually received a commission uh, for another outfit, and Ray Nance tried to convince John to take that commission, and he refused. He did not want to leave his friends. He was very dedicated to them, and he refused um, that commission. 
Uh, this is the Bedford Boys. Uh, I think a very haunting picture as well because this is the last photograph that we have of the Bedford Boys that was taken in Ivy Bridge. You can actually go walk down Ivy Bridge, the little village there. It looks just like this still. Um, and you can see, the, to me, a look of perhaps anxiety, uncertainty on their faces as they are leaving Ivy Bridge. And keep in mind, this was a very sad day for them as they're leaving Ivy Bridge because they had become so close to the community there. They loved it there, except for the rain. Um, they didn't like the rain. They wrote a lot about the rain, those dreaded moors in the rain. But um, they loved the people. And it was people in Ivy Bridge all gathered around them when they marched out of town and they cried. People sobbed. Um, because they knew they would probably never see these young men again. Um, and that was, that was very hard for them. Um, Company A is going to land on the dog green sector of Omaha Beach on DA. This was actually one of our plaques um, at the memorial. Um, and it's a little hard to see. Let me, I'm going to see if I can get my um, pointer to work. But if you can see dog green sector here, this is Company A right there. Um, and their goal is to take the D1 draw right here, the real. Um, and so the D1 draw is where they need to come in. Um, keep in mind, this unit has trained in many ways to be the spearhead, to, to spearhead this assault. Ray Nance used to tell me, he said, I don't know why, <laughs> looking back, why we, we fought to actually be, um, you know, the first. Uh, to go in, um, but they did. They were so well trained, um, and so they're going to go in on the first wave, 6:30 a.m., June 6, 1944, uh, at the reveal draw there, uh, Dog Green Sector. And as they're coming in, if you can just imagine, I don't know if you've been to Normandy before, um, but so they're coming in right through here. By the way, this whole avenue today, when you go to Normandy, is called Avenue de Bedford, uh, named after the Bedford Boys. Um, so this is, they're coming in uh, here, and uh, they're going to be met with just murderous fire, mortar, gunfire, you know, there's five MG42s on Omaha Beach, so just <clears throat> even if we're conservative of our, of our estimate of a uh, thousand rounds per minute, you can imagine the amount of fire raining down on these troops as they approach the beach. Um, it's it's honestly hard to imagine how any of them survive. Dog Green Sector here, WN-72. Uh, these uh, guns are trained uh, on the beach to overlap every single inch of beach. Um, no cover uh, fire, I mean, no cover, um, you know, coming in. You're carrying equipment, um, you know, 7,500 pounds uh, worth of equipment as you're coming off your landing craft. Just look at that photograph for a second. Look at and think about the fact that you've got all this equipment and all this wide open beach to cross, which of course they have, they have to cross this wide open beach because they had to land, and land at low tide. So all the obstacles are visible there. You can see the bluffs up, up kind of above the smoke there. You can see about a hundred foot up, feet up. And probably one of the most, um, Chilling accounts that, that I've come across uh, of many, but J uh, was from Jimmy Green, and I'll talk about um, that in just a, just a moment. But again, just um, picture this as they're coming in um, on their landing crafts. And um, again, look at all the obstacles. Again, some of these pictures might be hard to see, but you can see all the obstacles on the beach. Look how much wide open beach there is there. Wide open beach that they're gonna be crossing over under this intense fire as they come in. This is Frank Draper. Um, he was on LCA. By the, by the way, the Bedford boys did not come in on Higgins' boat. So the, the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan is pretty much the Bedford boys, okay? So as they're coming in, that's really where they landed and that's what they uh, encountered. But they actually came in on LCAs, which are uh, the British LCAs. And um, this is Frank Draper who came in on the LCA 10. Um, and the, the water is very choppy. You can imagine Bob Slaughter remembers being so seasick. They were very seasick. Um, a lot of people getting sick, just like you saw probably in the movie Saving Private Ryan. Um, and as Draper is approaching, remember Draper was one that played on the, the ball team there, the 116 Yankees. Um, pain explodes in Draper's arm as they near the beach. He drops to the bottom of the vessel. He's uh, obviously been hit. Um, his buddies try to keep him from moving. Uh, he keeps trying to stand up. He's in shock. He goes into shock very quickly, um, and eventually he loses consciousness. Um, he never made it to the beach. His, his comrades, some of the comrades there, uh, try to uh, get him back to the HMS Empire uh, Javelin, 
um, and his blood loss was just simply too severe. He ends up um, dying some, um, you know, we think about 12 hours later. Uh, there was a British um, sailor named Bert Fuller who stayed with him. Um, and he uh, carefully took his binoculars off around his neck and just stayed with him while he died. Um, and he never forgot that. He actually kept the binoculars throughout the war and eventually returned them uh, to the family. And then the, the family donated those to the memorial. But I think it's just such a powerful um, symbol um, of, that, of that loss. Um, Frank's family would never get over his loss. His mother um, quit work the very day that she found out that he had died and she never went back. Um, and uh, on his birthday in September of 1944, several months after D-Day, she wrote in the newspaper, I can't even see your grave except in a dream. You think about the, how hard it was for these families to even have closure because they didn't even have their, their bodies um, to grieve. It would be several years before uh, Frank's body would come home. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this because I know time is going to be getting short here, but um, you know, the DD tanks were supposed to obviously uh, um, provide a little bit of cover fire. We know that didn't go very well. Most of them swamped on the way in. Um, and Taylor Fellers, as he was coming in, and remember, these are his men. He's in charge of these men. And uh, Jimmy Green was actually res responsible for bringing his LCA uh, to the shore on D-Day. And uh, Jimmy Green actually visited the memorial. He, he uh, you know, lived in England. He came to the memorial um, and was very, um, very emotional um, about it. And he said, you know, <clears throat> he said, when the ramp dropped and that, when, when that ramp went down, he said, Taylor Fellers was so just, you know, um, intent on getting them there where they needed to be, precisely where they needed to be. In fact, Company A was probably the only, one of very few companies that landed exactly where they were supposed to be and exactly on time. And they bore the brunt of uh, the German forces there. But he said he started lining them, lining them up into skirmish lines. He watched this happening. Um, and as soon as he got them pretty much lined up, the Germans opened fire. Um, and he said it was just devastating. Um, and as he's watching, his LCA is kind of bouncing up and down. He's watching this uh, essentially slaughter that's taking place on the beaches. And he says, you know, the sailor always has a great respect for the troops he carries. And this is, he, he's going back to remembering what it was like when he dropped them off. And he says that his job is to get the troops where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. And when his job is finished, the troops job starts. If he doesn't always have a chance to say it from his heart, he still wishes the soldier the best of luck. I wish Taylor let Fellers and his company luck, but I never saw any of them again. All my lot were killed. Um, every single man that was on his landing craft died that day. Um, and that was very hard for Jimmy Green to, to reflect on. Uh, this is Roy Stevens. Uh, you heard me talk about Roy a lot because Roy was, he was my buddy. Um, Roy spent many, many hours at the memorial. It was cathartic for Roy. Um, Roy needed to talk about it. Ray couldn't talk about it. Roy needed to talk about it. And when he came back, um, he would spend every day when, after the memorial was built. And again, remember that was decades later, but <clears throat> he would come to the memorial every morning. We'd have a cup of coffee ready for him <laughs> and he would go and he'd, He'd greet visitors, especially talking to the kids. He liked to talk to young kids and tell them about D-Day. Not about him, but about D-Day. And one of the stories he told was about his brother. He had a twin brother named Ray, and they were like this. Nothing ever separated Roy and Ray. They did everything together. They went on double dates together. You know, They joined up together. They even bought a farm together. Um, they, they saved all their money, and before the war, they bought a 136-acre farm. And you know they were gonna they were gonna just live their lives peacefully on this beautiful farm, um, and Ray throughout the war kept trying to tell Roy at different times that he didn't think he was coming home, that he wasn't coming back, and he he actually even told Roy on a number of occasions, you know, take the farm, you know, I'm not I'm, I'm not coming home, and Ray just could never under uh, Roy could never understand it, he, you know, he di he didn't understand why he would talk like that, and it was the morning of D Day when uh, they were actually. Uh, put on separate landing crafts, and um, they had a deal that they were going to meet at Reveal Samir, um, and they were going to, you know, shake hands there. And that morning, um, before they're putting on their landing crafts, uh, Ray comes over to Roy to shake his hand, 
And uh, Roy said, no, no. He said he refused to shake his hand. He said, no, no, you know, we're going to shake hands at Reveal Samir. I'm going to see you there. And he said, Ray just dropped his head as if he knew that wasn't going to happen. Um, Roy said he always regretted that moment. If he could go back in time, he would have shook his brother's hand. He would have understood, but he didn't. Um, Roy's landing craft going in on D-Day would actually sink uh, going in. Roy spent several hours in the water. He's eventually rescued out of the water um, and uh, will go in several days later after the invasion. Uh, Ray is actually killed. By the way, um, Roy would go back um, for the 50th anniversary of D-Day. Many, many decades later, he would go back to that very spot he was supposed to shake hands with his brother, and he held his hands up to the heavens. Uh, it was, it was quite, a, quite a moment. Um, Roy also lost Grant Yop, also from Company A, who was like another brother because Grant came to live with his family when he was 13 years old. Um, so he was like another brother. Uh, so it was devastating um, when he also learned that uh, Grant uh, Yop also did not survive. Uh, the Powers brothers, keep in mind there were three sets of brothers in Company A. Um, and so Clyde Powers would lose uh, his brother um, as well. In fact, um, the Roy and Clyde were in the same landing craft So when it sank. And so they would come back several days later. And Roy said the two of them were intent on finding out what happened to their brothers, you know. Um, one of the first things they did when they got to the beaches, they, by this point, they had already started burying, uh, you know, the, the soldiers in temporary graves. And so they, uh, Roy said he went to the S section of the graves, um, and he knocked a clump of dirt off of some of the dog tags, and that was his brother. It was the first one he came to. And he said he couldn't believe it, and then Clyde found his brother. Um, and they said it just, it didn't seem possible, it didn't seem real uh, that they were uh, gone. Oh, John, let's talk about John real quickly because I mentioned Ivy Lynn and, um, you know, John, uh, Ivy Lynn was actually, again, right faithfully to John every single day. And on the, this was June 25th, uh, 1944. She wrote, it's been 22 months since we were married. It has seemed very long and yet unbelievably short in duration. The only constant thing about it is that I continue to love and appreciate you more and more each day. How it thrills me to realize that soon you'll be coming back home and we'll be together for the rest of our lives. Of course, she had no idea when she's writing that, that he had already been uh, killed on the beaches of Normandy. Um, it was very devastating for her. Um, eventually his Bible would come back home um, we actually have that Bible. It still has sand in it from where he fell on the beaches. Earl Parker is the only Bedford boy that actually had a child. Um, and many of the young men remember him standing um, on uh, board the ship the eve of the invasion, looking at her picture. She was a 16-month-old, his daughter. He had never met her. Um, and he's standing there looking at this photograph. And he just looked at um, his friends and he said, if I could just see her once, I wouldn't mind dying. And he was killed on the morning of D-Day. Um, another just heartbreaking story was Gordon, he White, uh, Gordon Henry White, um, who also was killed that morning. His wife, um, keep in mind, the bodies were usually not, if the family opted to have their bodies returned, um, that would happen around uh, two, you know, two years later. So most of the bodies um, for the Bedford boys came back in uh, 1948 is actually when most of them came home. And <clears throat> uh, they opted to bring uh, Gordon's body back to Bedford. Um, his burial had to be postponed, however, because uh, his mother had a massive stroke the day his body made it to the States. She was just so devastated. Um, and it was too much, and she actually fell into a coma. Um, Gordon's father said that she died of a broken heart and that D-Day broke their home completely. Again, I share these stories because it's, it's more than just what happened on June 6, 1944. These had such long-lasting impacts on these communities and these families. Um, Ray would survive, Ray would come back. And by the way, um, I think this is extraordinary. This is a map that we have uh, that Ray actually detailed um, landing on Omaha Beach and where he saw some of his uh, company A, where they had fell. He remembers seeing them, where they were on the beach, um, and he documented it. 
later, and it's pretty amazing to look at this map. Um, the only reason Ray survived, um, <clears throat> Ray actually came in a few minutes behind. He was with headquarters company, so he's, he's a few minutes behind the rest of company A. <clears throat> and when he landed, he actually finds a tidal flat. Um, he's, he's literally running across that wide expanse that you saw. Um, he, his, he's shot in the heel. He's, his, actually, his heel is almost blown off. And he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. He ends up jumping into this tidal flat. And if you've ever been to Normandy, they have these, little, these tidal flats that can be quite deep. I mean, several feet deep. Um, and he gets in that um, and actually stays there for a bit. He said he really has no idea how long he was in that little pool there because the gunfire just kept raking all around him every time he moved. And he literally had his nose sticking up out of that tidal flat trying to breathe. Um, to avoid getting shot. And so eventually he's able to make his way to the seawall uh, and he does survive. But as he's looking around, he realizes there's almost no one from Company A up against that seawall with him. You know, where, where are they all? He realizes that uh, so many of them have been killed. So there would be 41 young men from Bedford who would give their lives during the Normandy campaign um, and then later uh, battles in France. Um, and again, the 20 on D-Day alone. Um, for Company A, which is about 170, uh, 180 so men within the company, 91 were killed, about 64 wounded. If you do the math, it's about like a 91% casualty rate. Only about 15 men out of the entire company able to continue fighting. It was completely, the, the company was, you know, inept after that. Like they couldn't, they couldn't do anything after that. They were decimated. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, a pretty traumatic thing to see. The telegrams would not start arriving into Bedford until um, about five or six weeks later. Um, it's going to be uh, essentially mid-July. Now, everybody in Bedford, they knew they had taken part in something big. They, are, they had already suspected that. They knew they were probably, they were part of this invasion, but they didn't really know uh, any other news. They hadn't really heard anything. It's just starting to trickle in. And Elizabeth Tays, um, and I mentioned Green's Drugstore, so there's the little drugstore on the end. This is where the telegrams are gonna come in. Elizabeth is 21 years old, and you can imagine her job, so she comes into the drugstore. Her job is to gather the telegrams in the mornings. And on a Sunday morning in July, she sits down to the telegraph machine. She turns it on like she does every morning. And it starts ticking across. Uh, we have casualties. And she said, and then it kept going. And it kept going. And it just didn't stop. And she realized something very horrible had happened to Company A. Um, and people start gathering around her, uh, trying to figure out what to do because they realize all these families, they have to be told and people start volunteering. I'll take that one. I I'll go to, I'll go see this family. And they start going out to tell these families. Um, certainly a time that she will never forget. Um, one of the families was the Hobacks <clears throat> and, um, this is Bedford and Raymond Hoback. And they were actually getting ready for church. Uh, they lived right across the street from their church, the Hoback family did. And they were getting ready for church and um, they see someone coming up the drive and um, the Hoback's father actually opened the door and they're giving uh, the first telegram that Bedford Hoback has been killed on D-Day. And uh, Bedford Hoback was probably the rambunctious one in the group, by the way. Uh, Raymond was the quiet, reserved one. Um, I am very close to Lucille, who is still alive. Um, and Lucille is the sister of, um, of these uh, young men. And uh, she was 15 years old at the time. And Lucille can uh, distinctly um, just remember the devastation when that first telegraph came. And she said, the next day, we just, in our own innocence, we thought, well, we'll make some ice cream and we'll try to, we'll try to cheer mom and dad up. I mean, she was young. She didn't, she didn't know. Um, the next day is when they received another telegram. And that was that Raymond was missing in action. She said her father disappeared to the barn. Um, she'd never seen him cry before, but she said all the joy in their household died that day. Um, it was never the same after that. Um, and 
many, many years later, she can remember when her mother was on her deathbed, uh, she'd had a series of strokes. <clears throat> and she said as she's sitting there with her mom, she said her mom just kept asking, where are my boys? You know, where are my boys? And she said when her mom finally closed her eyes, she knew she was finally at peace because she would see her boys. Um, you know, it was devastating. And Lucille actually had uh, Raymond's Bible. Um, this was the Bible that um, he had carried onto the beaches of Normandy. Um, it was the only thing they had from Raymond because as far as we know, his body was washed out to the channel. He's on the tablet of the missing in the Normandy American Cemetery. Um, and they never recovered his body. So his, his mother really cherished this Bible, which was picked up by another soldier walking the beach and found the mother's address inside and mailed it, not knowing what happened to, you know, to Raymond, obviously. Um, and that family really cherished that Bible, and we actually have it in our collection. And one of our sculptures at the memorial is inspired by the story of Raymond. Um, that sculpture, you can see the Bible laying out by his head there. Um, and so in Bedford, uh, just to fast forward a little bit, um, the first monument would actually be dedicated in 1954. Um, it was quite a moment. Uh, General Gerhardt would actually come um, and dedicate this small monument. Um, you know, it was uh, still very raw at that time, only 10 years after D-Day. Um, but what's wonderful is you can go to these, you can go to Ivy Bridge, England today, and you're going to see all these monuments to the Bedford Boys, which is just really um, so touching. You can see uh, here the 116th monument, so not just the Bedford Boys, but the 116th monument in Ivy Bridge there, and you've got um, benches uh, where their Neeson huts were located. You can go to this park and read about the Bedford boys there. They really um, did a lot to memorialize them. And it was raining, by the way. I always think of the Bedford boys talking about the rain because every time I've gone, it's been pouring rain. Um, and that, that field there is where their Neeson huts were located. So it's really wonderful to see. I mentioned the Avenue Day Bedford there. And then I'm just going to wrap up by mentioning Bob Slaughter because uh, Bob Slaughter uh, was the founder of the memorial. Not, memorial. Now, he was not part of Company A. Um, Bob was in Company D of the 116th Infantry Regiment, 29th Division. Um, and Bob, Bob had actually worked for a newspaper when he came back from the war. And um, over time, he used to get very frustrated that D-Day seemed to have been forgotten. It's hard for us to imagine that today uh, because we know a lot about D-Day. Um, but at the time, he felt like nobody, pe people didn't even know what D-Day was, a lot of people. And he, was, he would be very frustrated that June the 6th would come and go and there was really never any mention of the anniversaries and things like this. So that went on for many years. And he finally decided to do something about it. It was in the 1980s. And he said, we really have got to remember what these men gave uh, all those years ago on the beaches. And um, he decided he was going to start a monument. Um, it was not an easy uh, quest. Um, he actually started by going around the country and speaking on D-Day. This was his order of the day, by the way, which was signed by all the men in his unit, 11 of whom would be killed on D-Day. Um, <clears throat> and he was from Roanoke that's very close to the memorial. It was the 50th anniversary of D-Day. He walks the beaches with President Clinton. And um, as he's walking the beaches there, um, you know, this is where the, the uh, momentum really picks up speed and they're able to eventually raise some money. Congress approved the uh, placing of a national monument to D-Day in Bedford because Bedford actually said, we will donate the land to make this happen. It needs to be here. Um, Congress said, we'll give you the title National D-Day Memorial, but we're not going to give you any money. So there's no, no funny, we're not part of the Park Service. Um, this has just been through people, veterans, who said, we have to remember. These were veterans who made this happen. Um, and Bob Sauter was one, and Bob Sauter got another veteran on board, which was Charles Schultz, famous Peanuts cartoonist. If you, if you ever noticed um, Charles Schultz, um, when he was alive on June the 6th, he would often have the Peanuts uh, cartoon. He made sure there was something about D-Day in those cartoons. He also wanted to make sure people remembered. That was very important uh, to him. He was just 20 years old when he was uh, drafted and uh, eventually ended up uh, seeing those graves. That's one thing that stood out to Charles Schultz is he remembers seeing those graves along the beaches of Normandy when uh, he landed. And he never forgot that. 
Um, so he was very much part of the early efforts. It was dedicated in 2001. Um, we had hundreds of D-Day veterans uh, there, but for us it's about making sure we continue sharing these stories, uh, the stories not just of you know, Ray and Roy, but all of those who participated, all of the Allied units. You know, it's so wonderful to walk out and see the living history out here and all the, the Allied units and everybody who took part. You know, this was a multinational effort um, that made D-Day happen, that made it a success. And so it's so important that we never forget that. And I know Roy and Ray would be very proud um, when, you know, they always were when they saw people uh, coming up and learning about this. The only last thing I want to mention, one of the things that we have done at the memorial, because believe it or not, when we dedicated the memorial, we wanted to make sure everybody knew who died on June 6, 1944. Nobody knew how many people died on June 6, 1944. There was nothing anywhere that told you. You can look at different history books, but they were all over the place. Some said 4,000 or 5,000. Some said, you know, 10,000. Uh, you didn't know. Nobody knew. So we started doing the research. And of course, um, we got kind of turned away from a lot of people who said, you'll never be able to figure this out. 20 years later, we figured it out. <laughs> it's 4,426 died on June 6, 1944. So we're the only organization in the world to actually research name by name every single sol soldier, sailor, airman, coast guardsman who died on June 6, 1944. Um, and we researched not just the Americans, but the allies as well. And you can go up to the memorial and see their names on uh, the wall. And we continue to add names. In the chaos of battle, records are difficult. And so we continue. In fact, we're adding another name um, on Veterans Day this year to the wall as we continue to drill through records and um, discover who died on D-Day. But you can go up and you can uh, read it, uh, see these um, names on our wall. And eventually we're gonna have a big education center. We've got the memorial itself uh, right now. We have um, a place where you can go in and see some of our artifacts and some of our Quonset huts. But we are gonna have a French village that will kind of continue telling the story. Um, we've got 15,000 amazing artifacts in our collection and to be able to see them uh, and to further uh, tell these stories is very important to us. And by the way, if you heard John McManus's talk um, or got any of the books signed by him, John McManus is the host of our podcast. We do a podcast called Someone um, Talked and it's, uh, we have different authors um, who come on and we, we discuss not just D-Day, but everything World War II, but that is the memorials, uh, the podcast that we host uh, with John McManus. So if you uh, don't have that, uh, definitely check it out because we talk a lot about um, so many different topics uh, during the war. And I'm going to end there, because I think that's all the slides I have. <laughs> and I could, I could talk forever. I could tell these stories forever. And I, I apologize if I go on too long about some of their stories, because again, having grown up and knowing the families the way I do, um, I mean, I didn't tell half the stories. Um, it's, it's very personal and, um, and still to this day, uh, difficult to talk about. Um, I will say Ray Nance eventually um, would come up to the mall and start talking about it. it you know, for, for Ray, it was so difficult. Um, Ray even wrote about it. He wrote this wonderful memoir and he refused to publish it while he was alive because he was so afraid that it would open all these wounds for the family members. Um, he was a postmaster. He, he, he delivered mail when he came back from the war. And can you imagine? Uh, he would go to someone's house and they'd lost a loved one um, and they would be waiting for him at the mailbox and ask, you know, what happened to my son? You know, um, that's what he came home to. Uh, it was extraordinarily difficult. Um, but he finally got to a point where he could talk about it. He never wanted to go back to Normandy. He never did but he did at least uh, come to a place where he could begin talking about it. And I'm so glad he got to do that before the end of his life. So I will open it up to any questions that you all have um, about either the Beffer Boys or the Memorial D-Day, our research project, uh, anything, anything that you might want to ask. Well, first let's have a big round of applause for <laughs> Again, we do have the microphone, so if anyone does have any questions, just throw up a hand and I'll come to you. Mm -hmm. well, I'll give us first and then I'll come to you. <laughs> Thanks so much for your talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, any, did any of the Bedford boys uh, see action in the Pacific? 
Yes. Oh, yes. Quite a few. Um, so, you know, I just talked about company A and that's one thing I do stress when, when people are learning about, um, the bed for boys, there were other bed for boys. This is just kind of the ones that we talk about, but in the community, you know, when you served, you know, you were a bed for boy. It didn't matter whether you were in Europe, the Pacific, we had quite a few that served in the Pacific as well. Um, and you know, they served in the Navy, they served in all the branches, you know, all over. So there were actually a hundred and. I, th I, th I hope I'm saying this right. I think there was 144 total uh, Bedford boys killed uh, in the Pacific and in Europe during the war. And again, for a tiny community, it was, I guess, you can imagine how devastating that, that is. Um, and many more who came back wounded as well, not to mention just the, uh, you know, coming back and learning your own community has been devastated by the war with so many who are no longer there. Um, very difficult times, but yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I want to thank you too. It's an awesome you. talk. Thank you. Um, the new name you said you were going to put on uh, Veterans Day. Right yes. Down there. You yes. recall if that's a U.S. soldier or someone from other he, country? He is. Um, Father uh, Maternowski, uh, actually, um, is this now? I probably shouldn't say that yet. You're getting the, the uh, you're getting the information firsthand now. First, um, who is an incredible story. He was actually um, a paratrooper um, who was killed by a sniper. Um, on D-Day, but the, again, the records were so, um, spe especially with paratroopers, what we have found in our research that paratroopers, often their bodies were found later. Um, and so it, it was difficult to prove when they died. And so we, we've had to do a lot of extra digging to get either firsthand accounts at the time and things like that to change the records. Because generally, if their body was found later, they were listed as the date of death the body was found unless they actually had eyewitness testimony at that time so um so it's been very difficult uh for some of those um but he is one that we've been able to show did die june 6 1944 and we'll be adding his name to the wall he was a sniper who uh, he was killed by a sniper while he was trying to get um set up an aid station uh outside of saint Maryglise, and um a very tragic story but more will, will come out on that and uh, we're really proud. It, you know, the, the wall is, I think, a place of healing, uh, and it has been um, for many of those who served in World War II. But I've also found it has been a place of healing for a lot of our um, veterans as well. Uh, we do a lot of events in our main plaza there, surrounded by the names. And um, I, I met a veteran uh, some years ago who was getting ready to be deployed to um, uh, Afghanistan. And he said to me, he came to the memorial uh, every time he was getting ready, he was on like his fourth deployment. He said, I come here every time before I'm deployed. He lived in Maryland um, just to look at the names and to remember kind of where we come from and that, you know, um, it, it gives me hope and it gives me uh, strength. Um, and so I thought that was very beautiful. But yeah, we will continue to add names. Mm -hmm. Thank you for putting such a human touch on it. Thank you. you. <laughs> um, I understand there were two other beaches involved that day besides Omaha Beach. Oh, yes. Um, were all those people counted too? I know those casualties absolutely. weren't as high. But. Absolutely, yes. We So um, the American beaches, um, certainly uh, Utah and Omaha for the Americans. Then we had Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches. Um, and so all of our research accounts for all five beaches, but not just the beaches, not just the infantry. Again, when we think of Saving Private Ryan, and um, you know, we think of the infantry and the beaches, um, but we also uh, have documented the Navy as well, the Coast Guard, um, you know, anyone who uh, was serving by air, of course, there were many, many, and those are another one that can be very difficult depending on, um, you know, uh, when their remains were recovered and when they went down and things like that. But, um, but yes, we make sure we uh, account for every single one. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. So mm -hmm. I have two questions. Well, the first one's fairly quick. It's how you recognize the missing mm -hmm. at the National Memorial. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question is, you know, you're very closely connected to this topic. How do you compartmentalize this? Because this is really heavy. And it's, you know, I think you hear everyone in this audience reacting to these stories, which are really tragic. Yeah. Um, and you're so close to the community. So I'm just curious um, about both. So I think um, having known so many of, you know, knowing, 
you, Ray and Roy and uh, so many of the veterans over the years, and not just them, so many others from different companies, from different units and divisions that you get to know, it's so important for them that the stories are told. And, and they, they've all always said to me, it's not about their story. They said, you know, we came back. Um, it's so important to them uh, to make sure young people know the stories. And so for me, um, it's a carrying on of that because most of them are gone now and it's very emotional, you know, that uh, as D-Days come and go and we do these huge commemorations, we've gone from having hundreds of D-Day veterans in our audience to having three or four. Um, and you realize that time is, is against us. And um, if we are not carrying it on, you know, carrying on their stories, and, and I say we, not just the memorial, I say we, as we learn these stories, it's important for all of us as American citizens to tell these stories because it's up to all of us to pass that on so that it is not forgotten. That's how we honor their legacy. And that's what I remember every single day when I tell these stories is that we honor them by sharing what they went through and by making sure it's never forgotten. Um, and that's really important. So I get emotional. Talk about it now, but it's, <laughs> no, it's so true, but it's, <laughs> um, but I feel, I feel their presence. When I walk around the memorial, I can feel, um, I feel it. And I feel like this is, this is, this is the kind of thing that they want to see happening. Um, people are learning more um, and passing it on. Um, and that was very important to them. And I'm so, so sorry, I forgot the first question. <laughs> no, no, Thank you so much for that answer. It's obviously very personal. I'm curious of how you honor the missing. Are they on oh, yes. that wall of killed in action, or is there a separate um, MIA wall? To right, anymore? right. So we do not have a separate MIA wall, and um, and, and part of that is just because the sheer number, truly, of still uh, MIA. Now, um, for D-Day, um, if they were MIA after a year, they were considered killed in action, so they would be on the wall. Um, but we do not, any, anybody post um, June the 6th who, who was killed, we actually do not have them uh, listed on the wall. We just do. So the research goes up to midnight of June the 6th. Obviously, we know thousands more died in the days that followed. St. Lowe was horrific. We know that, you know, the, the, the casualty rate right there was uh, significant. Um, However, we just we knew we had to kind of have a cutoff somewhere to just show people uh, this was one day, you know, and this this span of hours, this is how many died preserving our freedom, 4,426 and counting, really. Um, and so that was important to us, but it's also important to us for people to know that, yeah, thousands more died during the Normandy campaign and, and um, and then elsewhere, obviously, during the war, we do a lot of education programs um, uh, to teach young people the high, you know, the cost of the war. Over 400,000 uh, Americans gave their lives during the war. Um, and to talk about the scope of the war. I mean, um, I think that's really important for, um, for everyone to understand, um, you know, that essentially during World War II, one person died every three seconds for six years. I mean, how do we wrap our brain around that? It's just hard. It's really hard. I think we 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 can discuss that by talking about their individual stories. Really, Thank yeah. You. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you talked about uh, youth youth groups that come. That uh, most of them may not know what World War II was, mm -hmm. much less what D Day was. How do, how do you teach them about this? Yeah. You know, we've got a wonderful team and it's, it's challenging. I think you have to meet young people, especially um, where they are. And we live in a very digitized world now <laughs> where there's a lot of technology. Um, and so we, we are at the memorial, we do a lot. First of all, we do a lot of digital programming. So we can do a program, we do programs all the time in Alaska and California, um, you know, live programming. So that's important to us because we want to get the word out as far as we can about this history, why we need to remember, what was D-Day, what was it like, um, why was it important, why do we remember it today? And we do that through a lot of programming. But um, we also do a lot of things now that are, um, you know, we have this cool artifact gallery on our website. You can actually go onto the artifact gallery on our website and look at Frank Draper's binoculars up close. And because of all the technology now, you can move it around and look at it. I mean, it's really amazing what you can do with technology now that is very exciting for young people. We have augmented reality experiences where if you go to our memorial 
and you hold up your phone in front of our, I don't know if you've ever, some of you have been to the memorial, but our invasion tableau, which actually has the air jets under the water, so it looks like bullets are hitting the water and it's spurting up. Um, it, it's you know pretty haunting, um, but as you're standing there, you can actually hold up your phone and suddenly you're in a Higgins boat headed toward Normandy and you can see the cliffs and you can move your phone around. You can see uh, the planes. You can look around and see the other ships coming in. You know, that's, that's how we reach a lot of young people. And even our youngest visitors, you know, we have different types of programming set up. You, you know, it's never too young to start. Now, obviously these are heavy topics that you don't want to talk to with a five-year-old or a six-year-old, but you can start. You can start the conversation about what it means to serve, why we always thank our veterans. Um, I, you know, I'll never forget doing a program one time for a group of, of young kids, and I always ask if there's any veterans in the audience. And there was, um, there was a man who raised his hand, you know, and uh, we all thanked him, you know. But after the program was over, we, our program really talk about why, why do we, why is it so important to thank our veterans? You know, let's, you know, talk about that. And we, we will with the young people. And then after the program, all these little kids lined up and they thanked that veteran. They went by and they shook his hand and everything, and then they all left. And this guy comes up to me, I'd never met him before, big burly guy with a ponytail, leather jacket, and he's got his arms crossed and he comes up and he's crying. And, you know, he said to me, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I'd never been thanked by a group of kids like that before. And it was, that was so touching to me. And I said, I think it's never too early to start educating young people and, and then continuing to pass these stories on. So that's, we're very passionate about that. It's so important that we do that. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, thank you very all much right. for joining us this afternoon. Thank you all so much. <laughs>